126 on the 67. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the first fireside chat with our very own Jono Anzalone, Executive Director of the Climate Initiative. As folks are getting situated, I'll just remind you to please mute yourselves for the first portion of our gathering. Um, I will be monitoring the chat box. So if you have technical difficulties, comments, questions, compliments, um, feel free to type them into the chat function. Our first portion will be Jono himself regaling us with tales of the climate initiatives adventures of late and giving us a peek into the near future. And then for the second portion around 125, I will open it up for the I'm sure long awaited question and answer session. So you can think of this as a press conference of sorts. Um, I will first address the questions that were typed into the chat as they were received. And then if we have time, I'll open the floor for you to unmute yourselves one at a time to ask any other burning questions, suggestions, advice, um, intel, or points of discussion. So um, with that, I'd like to just say thank you again for joining us on this lovely afternoon and for being a part of the Climate Initiative family. You are basically the inner circle of sorts, so it means a great deal to the whole team, uh, most of whom are also here and featured on this title slide, that we get to spend time with you today. And so with that, I will turn it over to Jono himself. It is me. Good afternoon, everybody. I am so delighted to see familiar faces and also familiar names. Many mentors on the line as well. I won't uh, embarrass anybody, but I may call on you a little bit later. Uh, folks like Kevin King, who have been living a uh, real solid mission to help those most severely impacted by disaster with Mennonite Disaster Services. See Representative Tracy from our state legislator here. Um, so really just a cross section of folks that have been amazing uh, mentors and supporters as we're thinking about ways to help communities that are really at the end of the day severely impacted by many of the issues that we see related to, to climate change. So um, great to see friendly faces and friendly names on the line. Um, as Christina mentioned, um, we really had a phenomenal year last year and for many of you that are on the line that have worked with me in a different capacity, 
Um, really growing up as a Red Cross youth member from 1994 onward, um, I have to just reflect for a moment on where I was prior to learning about the Climate Initiative. And I was with my husband, Andy, in Central America working for the International Red Cross again. And I had heard about this organization and I Googled it and didn't find anything. And I learned that this organization wanted to try to reach 10 million youth by 2025. And I thought, huh, we're in the middle of a pandemic, um, schools are out. And um, at the end of the day, what I recognize is that much of the work that partners are doing, folks like Mike Pickrell, Kevin King, our folks at Knox County Emergency Management um, are only getting worse and more frequent and the impacts are being more um, pronounced in communities that can least afford it. Just overnight, we saw in Louisiana another devastating tornado in the month of March, um, which is really indicative of the challenges that we all face. So fast forward to December 31st of 2021, and you know, I pinched myself because me being the ultimate skeptic, I thought, how are we going to do this? How are we going to mobilize a brand new nonprofit that really was a proof of concept in the small town of Kennebunkport, Maine, where we had Kennebunk High School students working with the University of New England with our amazing programs director, Leah Lowry, Melissa Lucci, Gulf of Maine Institute, and the Conservation Trust, and how to really replicate that in terms of not only understanding the education of climate science, but taking that science outside the walls of the classroom making it about more than science, whether it be humanities and arts and social science, and really to scale that to 10 million youth between the ages of 13 years of age and 23. And for those of you that have seen our annual report, um, it certainly surpassed any of my expectations in terms of where we would be in currently 37 states having our learning labs implemented. Um, Louise Stevens and her team led amazing inaugural Collegiate Climate Policy Institute last week where we had amazingly engaged youth talking to congressional officials about things that were important to them, um, as well as also reaching nearly 9 million youth through social media channels. And, you know, I'm a 43 year old who doesn't use TikTok. I'm just now learning Instagram, um, but we certainly see the aperture that social media creates for youth to tease out the curiosity that comes from being a nonpartisan organization trying to find climate solutions. Um, so I won't bore you with the stats in the annual report. It's just to say that there is certainly an appetite for youth to feel like there is a vehicle and a platform, what a lot of people refer to as a third space for nonpartisan action for climate solutions. I applaud those that are partisan. I applaud those that are, are just taking a different approach. They're all necessary in fighting what arguably is the most existential threat to our planet and to humankind. So fast forward to um, some of the cool things we wanted to feature today. Um, one of the celebratory remarks for us is we were so fortunate to collaborate with Kika Media in the National Science Teachers Association over the last year and a half to create a spectacular set of five to seven minute videos that really exemplify and tease out curiosity, not only for youth uh, age 13 to 23, but even for adults that wanna learn a little bit more about the climate science. Um, so I'd like just to share with you a short uh, 45 second preview of the 10 beautiful films that are being featured through the National Science Teachers Association and are available to the general public to really celebrate um, how we think about climate science. So I'll turn it over to Christina to run the short video. Mosquitoes. They're more than just annoying pests. Every year, they make millions of people sick. And as the world gets hotter, even more people could become their victims. The rate at which people become infected with these mosquito-borne diseases depends really strongly on temperature. As our climate changes, where are mosquitoes going to go? And who will they strike next?
So this is one of a series of videos that is available on our website, as well as the National Science Teachers Association. And again, what we're using these, these vehicles for, I know I growing up um, had access to PBS documentaries and real cutting edge videos to spark curiosity with students and adult allies that are just trying to really dive into some of the most pressing issues that we face. So you, you saw the one on mosquitoes, there's one on how cows are eating uh, various seaweed type products to reduce methane, which is 80 times more potent and um, causes more harm to humans than even carbon uh, does. So there's lots of, of excitement that we have in partnering with the National Science Teachers Association which has really led to, again, creating this awareness uh, beyond what we ever would have expected within our first full year of operation. The other exciting piece on the legislative front with Representative Tracy here, I know is a strong supporter of this bill, is really celebrating how youth are talking with their elected officials about things that are important to them. Um, so we were very fortunate to have Kosi, who is on the line, representing our policy shop and really helping to promote the house approval for climate science training funds for Maine teachers, really unlocking a $3 million pot of state grants. And I use this example of just one element of policy and advocacy. We're not a 501c4 organization. We never desire to be one, but under the passionate auspices of what youth are thinking about, they want to make sure that what we're talking about in terms of climate science is systematized across our states, territories, and tribal partners. And there was so much passion for this particular bill and really trying to emphasize that it's not a partisan issue. We're not creating additional mandates that are unfunded. It's really creating an incentive structure for youth to really understand good science um, and the science that really drives a lot of the discussion around uh, climate change. Speaking of youth, uh, one of the exciting pieces that I really applaud our board of directors for, we were a brand new board really kind of thinking about how we reach 10 million uh, folks over the next three to four years. And uh, part of that is also really understanding how we measure impact, um, not just what I call outputs, not just the number of students that we reach, uh, but Michael and Andrew from Peer Associates, who's here on the line with us, have been on this eight to nine month journey on how we think about measuring impact. Um, nonprofits struggle with this, probably no surprise for anybody on the line that's either worked in a nonprofit or been on a nonprofit board, but really thinking about is what we're doing making a difference. And so the work that we're doing with PEER has really helped us to calibrate what's called a theory of change and really underneath that theory of change to think about measurable impacts through a series of outcomes and how we measure those outcomes. And part of that on the governance side, our board of governors who is extremely, I mean, they're just amazing human beings. Uh, but over the last year, we looked around and we said, geez, we're a youth organization. And one piece that is missing from the board of directors is a youth perspective, a youth voice. And so we were super delighted that just last week, our board of directors voted in our first freshman college student, which is representing a very um, amazing demographic of really passionate youth that are convinced that this is indeed the most existential crisis facing humankind. Um, so Alejandra Carrasco Ayola is going to be joining us um, as of last Wednesday is our first young person on the board as a freshman at Dartmouth. And the board currently has a campaign that is going to be ongoing for the next, uh, it's just closing up as a matter of fact this week that will add additional emerging leaders to the climate initiative. So systematically, we have an amazing set of youth ambassadors aged 13 to 23, as well as adult allies. And we recognize that one thing that the board really wanted to see was an institutional way to tie in perspectives from 13 to 23 year olds and hardwire it into our governance structure. So we can have up to 15 board of governor seats on our board. And the board is very excited in addition to Alejandra 
is to have an additional two seats that are connected to this 22 person emerging leaders council, which is really, again, allowing us to take a pulse from youth themselves on the things that are important to them. I'm 43. I mentioned earlier, I don't use TikTok. Um, there's a disconnect, right? I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a beautiful bureaucrat and weaving together systems and, and the overall organizational structure. But at the end of the day, what we're learning a lot about is really the things that are important for you. And Leah and the team do this very well. Megan, the marketing and communications team, um, Louise on the policy side, we're constantly pulse checking. What is it that 13 to 23 year olds are finding are important as it relates to climate science, climate justice, climate equity? And I use the last two as an example. It's clear throughout the country and through the samples that we have with the youth that we work with that climate equity and climate justice continue to be some of the most pressing areas of focus that the organization is really uh, spending a lot of time thinking about. So we'll stay um, certainly in tune with the outcomes of where the additional two board seats land. And we will also share with you the amazing success of where the Emerging Leadership Council of 22 youth um, really kind of leads to thanks to much of the work that Pooja, who is on the line here as our youth engagement manager really has thought through and really championed for the organization. So my thanks to Pooja and the team for, for thinking through this. Um, last but not least, um, before I share some, some other stats, is Stephanie Rivas, who may be on the line. I just wanna give Stephanie a huge shout out. Stephanie was selected amongst a large number of applicants as an emerging leader through the Green Biz Conference. And the Green Biz 22 Conference is a leadership forum of some of the most prominent corporations, Fortune 50, Fortune 100, Fortune 500 companies that meets once a year to talk about climate sustainability and overall green business. And Stephanie put her name in the hat as one of their selected emerging leaders to really go through an emergent process with corporate leaders from Pepsi, from Levi, from other major brands and was selected as an emerging leader. I was not surprised because she is incredible. And Stephanie is our regional coordinator. She's on the far right hand side of the group photo uh, to the left hand side of the screen. Um, she's our regional coordinator in California and just doing amazing work and really um, emphasizes many of the aspects of the top priorities that are um, on top of minds of youth, including climate justice and climate equity. So congratulations to Stephanie on that huge win. On the financial side, we're very happy to report we're in good shape, um, but we are also really working hard to flatten the base of the pyramid in order for us as a new nonprofit to really demonstrate what is called the public charity support test. So there's probably a couple lawyers um, on the line or folks that have worked enough in the nonprofit space that you probably are familiar with this concept, but a large part of our seed funding, including many generous donors that are on this line, allowed us to get things up and running in year one. And IRS really wants us over a period of five years to demonstrate what is called the public charity support test, which means that instead of having a highly concentrated, amazing amount of fuel, eco fuel for the mission, that we broaden that base over time in order to meet the 501c3 standards that the IRS has set out for nonprofits. So these are just some of the stats. Um, Christina, Julia, and the team have just knocked it out of the park. And many of you are on the line that are representing these households here. So I wanna thank you for that. Um, but also what we continue to see is great interest from the broader philanthropic community, individuals, corporations, and households to really expand this ability for us to continue to scale the mission. Um, so a large part of that, some additional metrics that we'll share with you really lie upon um, telling the story about what it is that TCI is doing, not only to reach the 37 states and educators in those states, but like Louise is working on with JVAN and COSI on policy, but the other tools that we have developed to have deep, meaningful engagement opportunities for 13 to 23-year-olds, it's going to take all hands on deck. 
Um, so we've been very fortunate moving from a handful, itty bitty handful of amazing support of 16 donors in 2020 when I started. I remember coming into the organization and I thought, oh my gosh, like the pyramid is awfully concentrated um, to, as you can see, over 242 philanthropic gifts last year. It's been amazingly meaningful. And what's not captured in that number is probably triple the amount of friends that have provided great counsel and advice on where our direction is heading and importantly, tips on things that we can do to better partner with organizations and really to stay in tune with the broader environment that we're seeing in terms of top concerns for 13 and 23 year olds. The other exciting announcement that we wanted to share with our friends here today, we are very fortunate that thanks to the generosity of Bob and Dottie King, we have been able to secure a future headquarters site for TCI. It's one of the only times in my life where um, we're not going to be doing a capital fundraising campaign. Um, thanks to the generosity of the Kings, um, we are able to ensure that these philanthropic gifts that we continue to seek are going 100% towards the mission of TCI, which is to empower youth voices for climate action. But right along Arundel Road for the locals, 263 Arundel Road, um, we purchased what used to be the old Batson uh, Brewery and the old hops farm that is there. And we have a beautiful site. Um, and we're currently in negotiation with the abutting property that is accessing the Arundel Road property for an additional six acres that the Kings um, are very generously fronting the um, purchase um, capital for, as well as the design and build out of the headquarters. So as everyone's probably aware, it's a really weird economy when it comes to building anything, supply chain anything, and labor market anything. Um, so we're, we're certainly excited to have this, but likely going to be a good two to three years out before we celebrate the, the opening of the TCI headquarters. Um, but all that to say, we benefited from starting as a remote team at the beginning of the pandemic when we started in our organizational pursuit to reach more youth. So this certainly is a certain cherry on top of the Sunday, if you will, um, but knowing that our team members really do span from coast to coast, many of them are joining us today. We have California employees, we have Louisiana employees, we have Miami employees, two in uh, just outside of Philadelphia, two in DC and the four of us here in Maine and Christina holding it up in Vermont. A large part of what we celebrate as a 21st century organization is really having staff and boots on the ground that are most closely connected to the communities that are most impacted by climate change. And I wanna emphasize that. The reason we intentionally selected staff in specifically Florida and Louisiana and Pennsylvania is largely recognizing that these are areas that have either policy blockers that really prohibit advancements for climate equity and climate justice. But as I mentioned earlier, places like Louisiana continue not only to have exacerbating climate related disasters, but also they are communities that are most exposed to the vulnerabilities of disasters. So a large body of the, the work that Louise Stevens, who's on the line, our director of policy led, is really thinking about how we have a distributed workforce in communities that are most impacted by climate. And last but not least, what I will say along those lines, um, we, for the first time outside of the Green Biz Conference, uh, took the Climate Initiative Roadshow on the road. It was the first time that I've been on an airplane since the beginning of a pandemic. And it was an experience. Um, I'm easing into the comfort level that comes with that. Um, but Christina, Louise, and myself, as well as our amazing board member, Harold Brooks, who is in the upper right-hand corner and to the right, um, spent a good seven days really engaging with individuals, thanking our existing donors, talking to friends that have aligned interest in climate equity and climate justice and reaching more youth, and really talking about the exceeding need that we see to emphasize the dire nature in which the climate crisis is progressing. Anybody that read the UN report last month is probably um, not encouraged by the dire nature in which it really stresses the need for bold action from policymakers, corporations, 
and larger communities, including the industrialized countries that really have high stakes in the game to really turn back many of the ills of climate change. So a large part of our focus last week was again to continue to raise awareness. And just today, as a matter of fact, uh, the Green Biz Business Journal published an article which I penned along with an amazing um, ally to help kind of think about how climate innovations are needed, specifically to focus on the most marginalized communities impacted by disaster. And Stephanie Rivas, who I mentioned earlier, um, is quoted in this article and really emphasizing how, if we think about many of the innovations of Silicon Valley over the last 20 or 30 years, how that level of innovative thinking coupled with youth enthusiasm and solutioning is really needed to focus on inclusion. Um, all too much, we see individuals that look like me that come from an amazing background with two parents and a middle income uh, socioeconomic demographic at the table talking about climate. And often there's not enough room at the table for those communities that are most impacted by disaster for a number of structural reasons. And this particular article, what we were excited to celebrate in the publication of this with GreenBiz is really looking at lowering the barriers to entry for those communities most impacted by climate change to really be at the table to solution and most importantly, to really advocate for the pressing nature in which we need to take bold action. So I've talked a lot and uh, certainly wanna leave plenty of time for questions and answers. And of course, trying to squeeze in a full year's worth of excitement is often very difficult to do. Um, but I want to leave it open for questions, comments, or certainly any um, feedback that you all have. Because last but not least, I will say we continue to be a learning organization. And I think part of the humble posture that I've been impressed with with our team is we're always asking the question, what else do we need to know? Who else do we need to talk to? So really being part of a regenerative uh, feedback loop in terms of how we can reach more youth and engage more youth is an exciting part of why we wanted to host today's call. So with that, I'll turn it over to Christina for questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you, Jono, uh, for the lovely update. I see representative here has raised her hand. So I would like to start with your remarks. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks, Jana, for the update. I uh, just want to offer congratulations because, wow, what a, what a year of great progress for TCI. So thank you for that. Um, I, I guess my two questions, I do have to apologize because I have to duck out for another call in about five minutes here. But I did want to say that um, I stand ready to help. I think, you know, we are starting to see some really good investment on the state with the uh, the climate, uh, you know, main can't wait plan, plan. And I think there's some, some really good initiatives that are starting to come to fruition there. And I stand ready to help and uh, look, certainly look to you guys for your insight and advice and energy and uh, the, the voice of our young people, which is so important to, to really elevate. So thank you for that. I would just end with a question um, in terms of the work and the progress of the year. Is there, you know, are there you know, one or two things that you would really highlight as key priorities for right now. Uh, thank you, Representative. Thanks for being on and your unwavering support, especially um, as state continues to really, I think, set an example for, for others in terms of what is possible. Um, I would say in terms of priorities, our team has talked a lot in terms of how we increase reach with indigenous communities, as well as black indigenous people of color. And it's been something that we've talked about in terms of the best strategy to do so. There's been um, one hypothesis is that we hire a tribal coordinator to really liaise, not only being from one of the tribal communities, um, but also to serve as a liaison amongst the beautiful mosaic of tribal communities across the US. I think from an equity perspective, that certainly continues to be top of mind for the organization in terms of of increasing that voice and that access. Um, that would be, I think, thing number one. Um, the second thing that I'm really excited about is really teasing out the policy platform under Luis's leadership with JVAN and COSI, who's on the line, 
is there's a lot of policy wonks, I come to find out, that are aged 13 to 23. And having heard from our, our inaugural Collegiate Policy Institute, like that passion and that interest, whether it be high school civics or debate clubs, model the United Nations, I think building out that portfolio in terms of policy opportunities for students is really an exciting priority for us this year. So I'd, I'd say those two, tribal BIPOC engagement, and then the policy platform is something that I get pretty excited about. Yeah, both of those sound, sound very uh, important. And again, I'm here to, to continue to, to work with you guys and find out how I can help. So thanks so much for doing this today and, and I'll see y'all soon. Thanks for being on. I will say that um, Tracy has lived in West Africa and has experienced, as she recounts in the chat, firsthand the devastating effects of malaria on her community while she was there and her friends. Um, so she was just remarking earlier about how great it was to see that there was a focus on mosquitoes in the context of climate change, which um, not really typically the first thing that you think of. So we um, appreciate your appreciation for the fact that mosquitoes are indeed relevant to the climate crisis. <laughs> Any other questions? Feel free to unmute yourself and one by one, ask away. Hi, John. Oh, Kevin King here with Mennonite Disaster Service. Good to see you and thank you for your presentation. I just got to say a, a kudos to your team and what you're doing. Mennonite Disaster Service is a recovery organization here in the U.S. and Canada. And we deploy volunteers, six or 7,000 volunteers a year responding and rebuilding. And so I'm encouraged by what you're doing because any organization that fails to focus on youth and young adults will fail to self-perpetuate. And that's something we're facing in MDS, Mennonite Disaster Service. And so this is inspiring. I look forward to a chance maybe we can get together and uh, sit down with your team and dream how we can uh, engage inspire young adults, youth, to rebuild back better, stronger. I'm convinced it can happen. Uh, some of the houses we're building in, in the Gulf states withstood 170 mile an hour wind. And uh, we can do this and also lower the carbon footprint. So let's keep talking. Again, kudos to your work. Thank you so much, Kevin. And we are delighted to share that we will be at the National Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster Conference. And we just chatted on Tuesday, we will have a booth um, because I, I get really um, jittery in a good way thinking about that interconnectivity. I think disasters being such visual, um, disastrous creatures and kind of thinking about that intersectionality with youth is one that I could not agree with you more. And thank you for all your leadership within the Mennonite disaster community for empowering the rebuilding of communities. Opening the floor again to questions. If you feel so inclined or if you're shy, you can type them into the chat. Either way, we just want to make sure everybody has a seat at the table and gets to say whatever they would like to discuss today, whether it's just points of discussion or questions specific to the climate initiative or our plans for the future. We welcome all questions. I've been looking for the way to do the hand, hand raising thing on Zoom. I've forgotten how to do it. I've forgotten. <laughs> I remember it being available at one time, but there's like clapping emojis and all this other stuff now. I was just, I wanted to ask about the, um, the, the rebranding from KCI to TCI because it, it, uh, it felt like it happened really smoothly, you know, like my, my compliments to the chefs. Um, <laughs> but I was curious if that had sort of always been the plan. Um, 
because I guess because of the smoothness of that rollout and and how quickly it happened. Uh, but you know, I just, I guess I'd be curious about how that how that originally came about, or if it had been like a secret plan all along. A very great question, Zachary. Um, I'm looking at Megan right now because I'm convinced Megan hides the grays that came from that process and um, certainly would love for her to react to my initial statement, which is, I don't think it was on the radar of the organization at its, its beginning, um, but it became very clear very early that you know, conversations to scale to 10 million youth, including those outside of the US, the first 10 to 15 minutes of the conversation was A, why Kenny Bunkport? B, what is Kenny Bunkport? Or C, where is Kenny Bunkport? And what we like to say, our legal name, if you look us up on IRS website or um, the Department of State, it's still the Kenny Bunkport Climate Initiative. And what we did as a doing business as to really just acknowledge the heritage and the tradition of where we came from and really to celebrate the amazing leadership, Lori Smith and others within the town of Kennebunkport, the neighboring town of Kennebunk to really embody conversations, tough conversations at time around climate change when people were in very different places around the issue. Um, so really taking that to the board and explaining that we perceive there to be less barriers of entry to having engagements in California and Miami by calling it something a bit less uh, geographically um, uh, centralized, I think was, you know, out of all of our board members, it went seemingly well. But Megan, I mean, as you probably all know, those of you that know me, I imagine like Megan just is like, poof, she pushes the button and beautifully it's unfolded. You know, there's always devils in the details, and I love Megan's reactions in terms of any reflections on the overall process. Yeah, so thank you, Zach, for the seamless comment. That was very nice. We can have a project management chat at some point, um, but I'm really lucky. I actually walked into a brand iconography and name um, that our original founders of this organization um, like our icon speaks no matter what that name is. We are a lighthouse, we are a beacon, um, you know, for our mission and what we're trying to achieve. So I think it was really great and helped with that seamless nature that our logo didn't have to change, but our name, you know, as we continue to grow and to be honest, COVID really forced us really quickly to scale our mission more uh, nationally in terms of where we were at the time. Um, so it was many months of conversation um, with our board, with our team, um, but it's one that we really feel has benefited the scale of what we're trying to achieve. Um, so super proud of our Kenny Bunkport roots. We always will be, um, but the climate initiative is really who we had to be um, in order for us to scale our staff uh, and our impact. Excellent question. Thank you, Zach. Um, I'm going to turn it over tentatively to 6B VIQG. <laughs> um, for that would be me. <laughs> Go for you. it. <laughs> okay, well, then I have to introduce myself. My name is Aninia, and I work for Sphere and also for the CHS Alliance. And I'm calling in from um, France, neighboring Geneva, and I, um, I know I, I'm not sure why I'm on the call, but I'm very happy that I am, because um, I'm about to manage the revision of the core humanitarian standard, and that is a standard which um, really sets out the way uh, humanitarian aid and also development aid should be. Um, organized around a people-centered approach. And there's two elements that are not very strong in it right now, and that is climate elements and also youth. And those are the two things that I've been hearing now that really, um, that struck me and that I think we can learn from you. So I, I would be happy to stay in contact. Uh, we can learn from you and maybe you um, as the climate initiative would be interested in considering working with a global um, standards framework like the CHS or maybe even Sphere, because those are 
standards that are set out to be for, you know, humanitarian, you know, global south, but that's not really true. They they are really applicable in all in all kinds of um, um, disaster situations. So I'm I'm curious to see if we can somehow um, connect after this and see where it takes us. And thank you. It was a very nice presentation. Thanks for the invite. Thank you, Aninia. And it's really, um, you definitely are, are calling in from the furthest geographic locale. So thanks for being on. And uh, you and I met um, pre-pandemic, just before lockdown in Geneva. And um, I had just met your uh, new executive director. And we were talking about a big sphere gathering in Panama, which I regret never happened. So this is a great picking up point. And um, just reading the facial expression of my team members, there's no doubt that we would be delighted to, to help brainstorm and also contribute um, in the revisions. And you're right, the, the intersections of climate and youth would be amazing additions to the sphere standards. So count us in. Over to you, Tim. Thank you. Um, I wish I were in France bordering Geneva, but I'm here in Biddeford, uh, just up the road from Kennebunkport. I've had the pleasure of meeting with Leah. She's been very generous to meet with me more than once um, to discuss uh, Biddeford High School's environmental club. We have a meeting tomorrow morning. We're just getting up and running there. Um, and I'm, I'm very curious, Jono, I, I think you mentioned that a couple of the priorities for the organization this year are reaching BIPOC populations and um, expanding the, the power of the youth voice in terms of setting the agenda. And that's very much what I'm interested in engaging high school students here. I wonder um, if there are one resources that you might point me to, or if there are ways in which that this group can help achieve the mission that you've laid out. Thank you. Oh, and one more. If you're looking to raise your hand, it's the reactions button, Zach. So next time you have a question. It's it's not intuitive. I need to provide some feedback to Zoom on that puppy. Um, it's a it's a great, well, first of all, Tim, like A, thank you for the work you're doing in Biddeford with youth. I think that's exactly um, uh, the thing that keeps us going every single day in terms of, yes, this is possible through Youth Voices. On the resources, I'd love Leah to reflect on this. Um, initially, absolutely, there are a couple of different ways. One is the idea with supporting educators like yourself and high school organizations is to provide not only technical resources, whether it's a policy toolkit or um, a, a module on invasive species, but also for climate clubs that just need a little bit of capital to get youth engaged and up and off the ground running is to say, hey, like 500 bucks goes a long way to get youth mobilized, to talk to their town council, to talk to their state reps. And part of our um, high school support model is to provide that access to capital to mobilize. Uh, the second piece is, is even with the Emerging Leaders Council is really using that as an opportunity to say, hey, Biddeford High School students, like there's an opportunity for you to serve in a national capacity as a leader in this space. And really, I think those opportunities, that's like one example. Um, we did a climate hackathon last month, our very first ever. And the idea was to give high school students some prize money to really operationalize a climate hack on soil or water solutions. And this amazing school in California had a dynamic presentation. And I believe the prize money, Leah, was $7,500 to operationalize. So, you know, what we're excited about is we're super privileged to be able to act as a conduit for the educators like you to say, here are real concrete opportunities for you to take it from idea to action. But I'll turn it over to Leah to see if there are any other thoughts that you may have on tools. Yeah, I think that for the most part, you covered most of them. I think um, the other one that I would say would be fantastic to start, especially um, 
when it comes to diverse voices is something called community conversations. And Tim, I think you and I kind of had a conversation about that before, but community conversations is such a great way to really empower youth voice to start conversations within their community with stakeholders and leaders in the community about things that um, problems the communities are facing in, the, in, in terms of climate change mitigation and adaptation. So um, climate conversations is a really, a, I mean, a converse, community conversations is a really good way to do that. And we have an entire work like booklet to help facilitate those types of things as well. Um, and certainly our outbound grants are always there to help um, kind of facilitate youth action projects within communities. Thank you. I don't see any other hands, but let's give it a couple seconds in case a brilliant, oh, Mr. Fitzsimmons, let's hear it. Hey, wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting us. Um, my name is Ryan. I'm with the, the Harold Alphon Foundation. I, I was curious, do you work with any of the colleges in Maine and the universities? Is there any, any partnerships you have with them or any that you plan to? Thank you. That is a great question. Um, I work for USM. Um, I'm a closet academic. Um, and part of the discussions have been how climate youth clubs manifest themselves in the college setting. So we have youth ambassadors from a number of colleges here in, in Maine. Um, as you probably are familiar with the pandemic, a lot of the traditional climate clubs dispersed uh, for obvious reasons, but the individual action's been quite, quite encouraging. So Colby Bates, um, USM, College of the Atlantic, one of my favorite examples, they're all favorites, um, but Mecca, which is the main uh, college of art now in design, they added design in, and we hosted a uh, really amazingly talented young rising sophomore as an intern to really cross promote this intersectionality of college and art. Um, and uh, Dr. Deborah, who is the president of the college has been really encouraging for us to continue that partnership and we'll be hosting another intern uh, this summer that Louise is working to finalize that exact scope. Um, but Leia, any others that I may have missed? College of the Atlantic I've mentioned, um, Unity, I'm trying to think of the other schools where we've had touch points. Um, we do have some, some touch points at Bowdoin um, <laughs> as well as um, Acadia University up in Nova Scotia, which isn't Maine, but there, um, there definitely is some connections with basically looking at the bioregion of the Gulf of Maine. So yes, we do have connections with college and I, and I think our opportunities that are available to them are through some of the offerings that we have with toolkits and community conversations and that sort of thing. But we hope to grow that. And as our students kind of move on from high school, we're seeing that evolution kind of naturally come into play. Great, thank you. And last thing I'd say, that was an excellent question, Ryan. Um, our teams talked about both in Maine, but also broadly across the US. Um, even the language that I sometimes catch myself using is high school and college, and really trying to reframe and thinking in terms of 18 to 23 year olds. And um, the community college and trade school demographic has been largely underrepresented in terms of climate education opportunities. And really kind of open hypothesis in terms of how can we create spaces for um, journey people, the trades, to really learn about green in the industry. Um, and I'm convinced that like a dollar spent on a climate club and a really well-resourced university is less effective than a dollar spent in a trade school or in an alternative school. So we have not cracked the nut on this one yet um, because it's a very complex system and clubs aren't as prominent within the community college system as you all know. So we're thinking about ways with Megan's magic and the marketing communications aspects to reach that demographic in a way that is genuine and give them opportunities similar to um, the climate hack. If we did one with plumbing or electrical, we're just like thinking outside the box in terms of that um, entry pathway that doesn't necessarily have to be a four-year four degree. So stay tuned.
we, we, and if you have ideas, we're open to them, certainly. Last call for questions, comments, compliments, criticisms. Um. <laughs> Christina, can I just add real quick, um, yes. more, more comment. I think the, the stars, if you will, have aligned in so many ways between private and public engagers. Um, and I just wanna call out both with Knox County EMA representing local government body in Maine, uh, Mike Pickerel and the team at FEMA. For anybody that hasn't read FEMA's revised strategic plan, equity and climate are at the top. Um, and in my many years of being in the disaster world to see climate A recognized in a FEMA strategic plan and B equity recognized in a strategic plan is a mountain mover in so many ways. So just kind of connecting that government piece from the federal all the way down to the most local, I think is a really amazing opportunity for youth to really feel like there's enablers um, working through uh, the partnerships that often can, can make broad sweeping systems changes. So just wanna thank um, our Knox County friends, our federal friends on the line, as well as anybody from the state and certainly Lori Smith from uh, the town's perspective. Thank you. Thank you. So looks like that is going to do it for us for our very first fireside chat. Um, thank you to, I wanted to call out Lissa Wynn Stanley because she gave us the idea to do these quarterly, which is the reason that we're here today all together. Um, I also want to thank all of you who attended for your candor and your interest in our mission and your excellent comments and questions and the overwhelming um, willingness to work with us um, as a team. So that's been really great. Um, thank you to any of the board members who attended, those folks from our local Maine foundations, organizational partners, sponsors, government representatives, um, the folks at Ken and Bunk Savings Bank, my favorite, especially you, Zach and Doug, um, Phil Coop from Revision, Revision Energy, our friends at FEMA, um, Kiki, the visionary behind our beautiful Planet video series, Dr. Magiawala is here, um, Harold Brooks, Billy Shore, who else did I see? Um, our friends at Red Cross, and you know everyone else who came your questions were really deep your insights are deep um, and the rest of your day is yours um, i am always here if you think of anything else that you'd like to ask or have any other pressing matters to discuss so just feel free to shoot me an email i'm at christina at the climateinitiative.org anytime seriously anytime. And so um, with that, I bid you adieu, auf Wiedersehen, um, good day, and goodbye for now until we meet again. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. See you all later. Bye-bye.